On August 21st, 2013, chemical weapons were used in the Syrian conflict yet again. Western powers, the U.S. and France in particular, didn't hesitate for a moment to take advantage of the tragedy, decrying it as a crime against humanity and using it as a springboard to announce their preparations for military strikes against the Syrian government. Make no mistake, this was a crime against humanity. But the gas was not used by the Syrian government. It was used by the NATO-backed rebels. In this video, we're going to show you definitive evidence to support this claim. And we're going to explain the U.S. and NATO's motive for committing such an atrocity. Now, in order to really understand this event, we need to look at it in context. The United States has had Syria and Iran in their crosshairs for a long time. The plans for these wars have been in the works for over a decade. About 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and... I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and, and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the joint staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me in. He said, sir, you got to come in. you got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> He said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to al-Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. The U.S. government doesn't like to present its wars as empire building. They prefer to paint themselves as defenders of democracy and human rights. To accomplish this little public relations sleight of hand, they've proven time and time again that they're willing to flat out make stuff up. And they're willing to kill thousands of people to advance their political objectives. We saw a blatant example of this in the Iraq war, where they tried accusing Saddam of still harboring the chemical weapons that the U.S. had provided him in his war against Iran. Even back in the 80s, the U.S. was trying to take out the Iranians. They didn't like the fact that their puppet, the Shah, had been ousted in 1979. And as Wesley Clark pointed out, the end game is still Iran. For a long time, they tried going after Iran directly by accusing them of building nuclear weapons. But this line of worn-out propaganda fell apart when elements within the CIA and Mossad came forward stating that there was no evidence that Iran even intended to build such a weapon. You can only cry wolf so many times before people start rolling their eyes. So these chicken hawk neocons switched their strategy and decided to go after Syria to get to Iran. They know that Syria and Iran have a mutual defense agreement, and if NATO forces enter Syria, Iran will be drawn into the fight. Rather than attacking Syria directly, the U.S. and NATO have been running a proxy war by arming and funding the Syrian rebels, also known as the FSA, funneling these resources through their allies in the region. To obscure the source of this support, Qatar has been used to purchase the weapons from countries like Sudan, then route them to Syria via Turkey. Qatar is a close military ally of the U.S. They provided tank support in the Gulf War of 91, and Qatar served as a U.S. Central Command headquarters during the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. Fast forward to January of 2013 when it was revealed that emails and a large quantity of sensitive documents from Brenham Defense, a U.K.-based military contractor, were leaked by a hacker. These documents exposed a proposal coming from Qatar to launch false flag chemical weapons attacks in Syria and blame it on the Syrian government. According to the documents, the plan had the full support of Washington, and enormous sums of money had been offered for the project. The person sending these emails was David Goulding, the managing director of Britom. The address C was Philip Doughty, dynamic director and founder of Britom Defense. By accessing the servers, the hacker was able to obtain the scans of Doughty's passport, resume, as well as the passports of the Ukrainian operatives that the email suggested should be used to carry out the attack. The leak also included hundreds of other documents containing detailed financial and operational information for Britom Defense, including scores of signed contracts, weekly assessments, and incident reports for projects in multiple countries. Among these were details regarding a contract with Saudi Arabia to help prepare their forces for war with Iran. The leaks also depicted a tight business relationship with the infamous war profiteer, Halliburton. The documents acquired by this hacker were not easy to come by. Most of the places where they were uploaded were taken down very quickly without explanation. However, we did manage to get the files, and we've spent quite a bit of time analyzing them. After investing this time, it's very clear to us that they're real. 
This leak was never mentioned by the mainstream media at all in the United States or Europe. And there was no investigation whatsoever, even though what was being discussed here was clearly plans to commit a war crime. Three months passed, and on March 19th, sarin gas was used in Syria near Aleppo. Israel and the U.S. promptly blamed the Syrian government for the attacks, even though many of those who were killed were Syrian government soldiers. Obama began talking about the event as a red line that had been crossed, and the warmongers began their saber-rattling in earnest. However, the U.N. insisted on investigating the issue themselves. And on May 6, 2013, U.N. investigator Carla Del Ponte went public stating that evidence from their investigation indicated that it was the Syrian rebels who had used the sarin gas, and that there was no indication that the Syrian government had launched any chemical attacks whatsoever. Russia's U.N. ambassador, Vitaly Churkin, agreed with Del Ponte after Russian experts visited the location where the projectile struck and took their own samples of the material from the site. Those samples were then analyzed at a Russian laboratory certified by the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. According to the lab results, they found that the presence of hexogen, utilized as an opening charge, and which is not used in standard chemical munitions, pointed to the attack being launched by the rebels. Rather than cover this development, the mainstream media did what they always do when they don't want the public to look at something. They simply changed the subject. Now, of course, the fact that the U.S.-backed rebels had attempted to frame the Syrian government in order to build support for a NATO invasion would be bad enough. They were trying to start a war of aggression. But let's remember that sarin gas was in fact used. This means that the U.S. and its allies were willing to commit a blatant war crime, killing scores of civilians in order to justify toppling Assad. Nor did the U.S. withdraw their support after this event. In fact, they increased it. In July, the U.S. began openly discussing, quote, kinetic strikes against Syria, as if their lies hadn't been exposed. This, of course, brings us to the attack on August 21st, 2013, where they attempted once again to frame the Syrian government for the use of sarin gas, and once again, they got caught. The first wave of media coverage tried to pin the attack on the Syrian government, and the U.S. and France instantly came out condemning Assad. By August 24th, the Pentagon had already announced plans for missile strikes. But even as they did, their story was already falling apart. The Syrian army came forward that same day with footage to back up their report that they had uncovered a massive chemical weapons cache in rebel tunnels in the Damascus suburb of Jobar. This is the exact neighborhood where the chemical attack took place. The Syrian government's version of events is backed up by several key bits of evidence. 1. On May 31, 2013, security forces in Turkey found a 2-kilogram cylinder filled with sarin gas after searching the homes of Syrian militants. 2. On July 7, the Syrian army went public about a chemical lab that they had found belonging to the rebels in the city of Baneas. And 3. We already have these documents clearly showing that the U.S. was backing a plan to frame the Syrian government with chemical weapons. All of this clearly shows that the rebels had the means and the intent. However, the most obvious variable in this equation is motive. The only parties that benefit from launching this attack are the Syrian rebels, the U.S., and its NATO allies. The Syrian government knows full well that the U.S. and NATO have been looking for any excuse to invade. The last thing that they want to do is hand them that excuse. The rebels, on the other hand, have already been caught committing brutal atrocities, and they've already been caught creating fake video of civilian casualties. The clip you're watching right now is one of the most famous examples. This chemical attack, launched on August 21st, fits with their previous pattern. The rebels further exposed their hand when two days after the attack, they released a video statement vowing to strike back with any and all means. They claimed to have access to chemical weapons, and they stated that they now intended to use them in the conflict with zero reservations from this point forward. Essentially, they're using their own crime as a pretext to openly start using chemical weapons in combat. The stakes in this cover-up are high. Russia and China have both openly sided with Syria and Iran, and Russia has warned that thermonuclear war could result if the U.S. continues down this path. That's an outcome that's too horrific to even contemplate. However, even if that worst-case scenario is averted, this is still a matter of life and death for the Syrian and Iranian people. If the U.S. invades, a lot of civilians are going to die. Their situation is not going to be improved by the U.S. attacking, any more than it was in Iraq or any of the other countries that we've toppled. We have to do everything in our power to stop this. Please help us get this information out to everyone, especially those in the military. Share this to Facebook, to Twitter, post it on your website. If you're in the military and you find this video, Please send it to your commanding officer and to everyone that you trust in your unit. If you're afraid of being punished, then find a way to send it anonymously. Hundreds of people were killed in these attacks, many of them children, and the U.S. government was behind it. If you're a parent, imagine what it would feel like if it were your son or your daughter who had been slaughtered to forward the political objectives of these psychopaths. Think about it long and hard, because these things have a way of coming home to roost. For more videos like this, subscribe to Stormclouds Gathering on YouTube. And our website is stormcloudsgathering.com.